So we're going to continue on with self-signaling, and now we're going to go through a specific example. So the example uh, that we're going to look at is for something referred to as the IP3 pathway, sometimes called the IP3 DAG pathway, and we're going to get into defining what those things mean uh, in just, uh, just a little bit. So um, the breakdown of what's going to happen, we kind of have over here, first messenger is going to be the signal. All right, so what we have to set this up Here's the phospholipid bilayer. It's going to be the cell membrane. There'll be proteins with it. We're going to add some of those now. Here's the cytoplasm of the cell. And now this is an interior membrane within the cell. So again, in a eukaryotic cell, there are other membranes making compartments or the organelles within the cell. And in this example, this membrane is going to be the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So it's the endoplasmic it's called reticulum. And it'll come up several times in the course. It does a, a number of things. It's a place where protein processing uh, takes place. Uh, protein synthesis occurs directly on or at the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it stores certain, many a number of enzymes that are unique that aren't found other places in the cell. And in this case, it's going to be, um, in our example, it's going to be a storage site for calcium ions. Okay, so we're going to have a lot of calcium ions here inside the endoplasmic reticulum that we don't find out in the cytoplasm. So here's the outside of the cell. This is so we call this the extracellular environment. And that's where the signal is going to come from. So this is what we're starting with. In the cell signaling process, we have a signal molecule, and that's what we call the first messenger. So who or what is that first messenger? Uh, it depends. It could be a variety, said, a variety of different types of molecules. It could be a neurotransmitter. Um, it could be a hormone. It's a variety of different types of molecules that could be this first messenger. The first messenger is going to bind to a receptor. And in this case, our particular receptor uh, is, in our example, it's going to be a G-protein linked receptor. And they have a unique property. These are transmembrane proteins that span the membrane seven times. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we call them a seven pass transmembrane protein. Seven pass transmembrane protein. And that is the receptor. That's it right there. So the first messenger, or the signal molecule, will bind to the receptor. So that's a transmembrane protein. Protein. There we go. Now, in the cytoplasm, on the cytoplasmic side of the cell, we're going to find that's where we see the G protein. So the G protein is a peripheral protein. So here's our G protein. It's peripheral. It's only attached to the one side of the membrane. It's embedded within the membrane, and it's going to be carrying with it a molecule of GDP. And that's inactive. That's the inactive form of the G protein. So the first messenger binds to the receptor. The receptor is going to change shape. So now it's going to be activated, and it's going to attract the G protein, and they're going to bind. When it binds to the G protein, the GDP is going to be dropped. It's just going to get rid of it. Okay, so I'm going to erase it from here. And then what happens is the binding site within the G protein attracts a molecule of GTP, the triphosphate form, the one that's carrying more energy. So GTP will come in. That activates the G protein. So now a part of the G protein, this is still the G protein, it's called the alpha subunit. It's the part of the G protein that's holding on to the GTP is going to move laterally, you know, within the mem along the membrane surface, right? It's moving. And it's going to move over here to an enzyme called the effector. Okay, so this is the effector. That's here. That's an enzyme. 
And in the basic model that we've looked at before, uh, the effector makes the second messenger. Okay? And then the second messenger activates the protein kinase, and then the, the cellular activity is carried out. But now we're going to take this a step further, like I said, and we're going to go over a very specific example. So we're going to look at the specific second messenger. So regardless of whether this is the IP3 pathway, the cyclic AMP pathway, or uh, another, the basic mechanism here is about the same. First messenger to receptor, receptor to G protein. G protein is activated with GTP. It then moves to, on the, on the cytoplasmic side of the cell, the inside of the cell, it moves to the effector, which is an enzyme. Now the effector in this case, right? so our uh, effector here in this particular example has a name. It's called phospholipase C. And what phospholipase C is going to do is this. It's going to take our phospholipids. I'm going to use a, a simple phospholipid. So phospholipid, okay, phospholipase. So an enzyme a ends in ASE. That tells you what it's going to do. It's going to obviously do something with a phospholipid. If we blow this up a little bit more. So if we go back to the structure of a phospholipid. Uh, if you remember, there's a three carbon glycerol. Okay. Then um, without drawing all the details, there are two fatty acids attached to the glycerol, right? Those are, the, those are our tails. Then also attached to the glycerol is a phosphate functional group. That's part of the polar head and then some polar molecule. Well, in this particular case, the polar molecule's name is inositol. And this inositol is going to have additional phosphates attached to it. Now, what's going to occur is this enzyme, this phospholipase C, it's going to cut off the head of a phospholipid. So this enzyme is essentially going to Oh, this one's drawing over here. It's going to cut the head off of one of these phospholipids. So you're going to have the two tails still attached to the glycerol. And now the polar head from the phospholipid that was here has now been released. Right? And it's just free within the cytoplasm. So what, what is that we're talking about? It's right here. So this phospholipase C is going to break that bond. We now have this molecule. That would be the polar head of the phospholipid. And we refer to it as inositol triphosphate and that's IP3, inositol with three phosphates, okay, IP3. Now, the, there's another part though to this, right? There is the glycerol with the two fatty acids. That's called a diacyl glycerol. So the glycerol plus the two fatty acids, di, two fatty acids, acyl. Uh, and that's left behind too. That's so, that's right here. Okay. That's the DAG. And here you have, it's the IP3. So we said this is going to be called the IP3 DAG pathway. Okay, so those are the names of two of the second messenger, two of the messenger molecules. IP3 and DAG are both messenger molecules. And where do they come from? They come from the phospholipids themselves, phospholipid part of the membrane. So this is why it's important to understand structure and the chemistry behind the membrane before we get into process and things that occur within the membrane, jobs of the membrane, because you can't really understand some of these particular jobs and some of these more complicated processes unless you understand the basic chemistry of the structure of the molecules involved in that process. Right? So make sure you know the structure of phospholipid or you don't, you're not really going to get, get this. Now the tails stay behind. They can't move anywhere. They're just stuck here within the membrane. They can move laterally and they are going to move, right? but in this case right now they're, they're staying here. But the IP3, the polar head, can now diffuse through the cytoplasm. And what it's going to do is the IP3 is going to be another signal molecule. Here in the endoplasmic reticulum, what we're going to have is a gated ion channel.
So when we studied ion channels, remember we had signal gated ion channels. In this particular case, this signal gated ion channel is closed and the calcium is stuck inside the endoplasmic reticulum. There's a high concentration of calcium here. There's low concentration in the cytoplasm. The calcium would like to get out of the endoplasmic reticulum and move into the cytoplasm, but it can't pass across the phospholipid bilayer. There is an ion channel that would allow calcium, but it's closed. The signal, IP3, what it's going to do is bind to that ion channel, and it's going to now allow the calcium to flood out into the cytoplasm. So now calcium, calcium, Ca plus 2, ions are flooding out into the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is, is getting inundated with calcium ions. It's going to affect the membrane potential, and a whole bunch of other things are going to happen. Okay. That's not the end of it, though. All right, that's, just, that's what the IP3 does. So in this particular pathway, the IP3, the polar head of a phospholipid, is an internal cellular signal that opens up a gated ion channel and releases calcium. Now, the last part of this is to get to the target protein. Well, this target protein is going to be activated with two different things. All right, I'm going to erase some of this. We have a little bit of uh, additional room here. And that target protein is actually going to use both the DAG, this part here, and the calcium ions. Okay, so the IP3, that, that was already used. That's the signal to open up the ion channel. The target protein is going to sort of have two switches. All right? It's kind of like a, a room that has a light switch on it, and there's actually two switches to, to get the lights fully, say, turned on. You can kind of flip one switch and you kind of get half of them turned on. And then you have to do the second switch and that either makes them brighter or it turns on sort of a second set of lights. Well, in this particular case, what we have is the, the phospholipase C makes this DAG molecule. And then from the endoplasmic reticulum, we get calcium ions released. The two of them together will then go to a uh, our target uh, protein, okay, our protein kinase. And it requires both of them to activate it. So uh, the protein kinase is going to require both the DAG and um, the calcium. It needs these two things. These are they're both considered second messengers. Okay, so the DAG and the calcium are both second messengers. They then bind to this protein kinase, activate it, and then it can carry out some activity or action within the cell. So it's kind of it seems kind of complicated. There's a lot of things going on. But what the importance of this particular model uh, is, is many, many fold uh, reasons why it's important. First off, um, IP3 pathway is a very common cell signaling pathway. Uh, ultimately, it, in other courses, you will study um, communication uh, between cells uh, from a variety of ways in physiology, in a human physiology course, um, in study of bacteria, look at, at signaling. Um, there's all, all different places where you will look at signaling uh, for cells and an IP3 pathway is one of the, the most common um, processes and uh, that pathways that carry out cell signaling. Again, hundreds, thousands potentially of different first messengers and then tons of different actions or activities that would take place within the cell. But the overall mechanism is going to be the same. Signal binds to the receptor. It always has the seven pass characteristic to it. The receptor binds to the G protein, who's just a relay, kind of picking up GTP and providing energy to the effector. In this particular case, the effector will bind to one of the phospholipids of the membrane. It'll cut the head off it, which is inositol with three phosphates. That then binds to a, an, an ion channel, opens up the gate, and allows calcium to flood into the cytoplasm. At the same time, the two tails that were left behind with the glycerol, the DAG, is actually another signal molecule. That's another second messenger. It will then move within the membrane right, and ultimately find 
the protein kinase, who's also attached there. There's not enough room for me to, to draw it, but it's going to be attached to the membrane. It then, along with the calcium, will activate the protein kinase, which will then carry out an action within the cell, which could be, again, DNA replication. It could have to do with gene expression. It could be with metabolism. There's many, many, many possibilities. Um, and that's the basics of it. So make sure you know the membrane structure. Um, the generic things, phospholipids, transmembrane proteins, peripheral proteins from that aspect, but now know also the, the different names, the very specific names um, of these types of proteins and their jobs. And if you get that, then this is kind of putting everything together from really the whole block of material on cell membranes.